From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Martin here. I was up the street when you Listen, called. Listen, Sheriff, they've traced Kathy O'Dear here to your nice little town of Brambury. Who has? Nick Shearn's boys. One of them, a trigger man named Benny Stark, came out to the sawmill hill a few minutes ago. I traded a couple of shots with him, but he got away in a car. Did he head north or back toward town? Toward town, I think. You can't see the turnoff from here. All right, Dollar. You're packing a gun. Will you take the pickup truck and block that turnoff? Hold it until I can get somebody out there to relieve you? Right. How many deputies you got? Deputies? Uh-oh. What about volunteers? Is this Benny Stark the man Kathy's afraid of? He's one of them. Then I'll have volunteers. Twenty men within a half hour, armed with deer rifles. And every one of them a dead shot. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the home office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item eight, three dollars sixty cents for two packs of cigarettes and a pint of applejack borrowed from the foreman's locker at the sawmill. I figured these as standard equipment for holding down a roadblock at ten degrees above zero, and Mike O'Dare agreed with me a hundred percent. Well, I'll tell you one thing: they can make it out of corn, rye, barley, make it out of gold if they want to, uh, but they'll never come up with anything better than what they make out of apples. <laughs> here, here, have a short one, Johnny. No, no, thanks. I'll save it for later. Well, I'll just. Uh... It's got the taste of Indian summer in it. You ought to see this country around that time of year, Johnny. Break your heart, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful now with the snow on. And it would be more so if there wasn't a killer running loose in it. Johnny, I want to ask you something about my daughter. And I want you to answer me honest. All right. It's no use trying to fool you. She's here all right. I know. But she hasn't told me what it was that happened in New York. What she ran away from it. Somehow I figured it was just as well not to ask her. Your sheriff, Dan Martin, said practically the same thing. Dan's been in love with Kathy since he was 12 years old. He's a good man. Solid. So I figured. Anyway, she was scared. Scared half to death. And she'd come home for help, so we tried to help her. What was it you wanted to ask me, Mr. O'Dare? You mentioned a murder case, Johnny. You didn't give any of the details. Just said that Kathy was a witness. Is... Is she mixed up in this murder? And you wanted an honest answer. All right, I'm not sure. I see. That's why I wanted to talk to her, get her story, the truth. I realized from the start she might be guilty. I don't think so, but it's a possibility. You may as well know about it. I guess you realize it wouldn't make any difference. Not to me or to Dan. Oh, yeah, I figured. In other words, you're with me as long as I'm trying to protect her. But you'll fight me if I find reason to think she's guilty. That's about it, Johnny. Well, at least we know where we stand. And I hope it won't come to... What's the matter? Car coming. Light on the trees there at the bend. Yeah. You suppose maybe... Probably not, but you can't tell. Better get behind the truck just in case. They'll have to shift into low to edge past us. And let me get that spotlight on. Hey, I guess I'll just have another quick one. Wind cuts right through your bones. It's a dark-colored sedan. It might be him. Funny. I'd been hoping for two months that Kathy'd come home for Christmas. And I didn't figure I'd be out here in the woods, hiding behind a truck, waiting to shoot it out with somebody that wanted to kill it. It's a crazy world. Keep your head down, Mr. O'Dear. Yeah. Hmm, just the driver by himself, wearing a dark hat. I don't know. You know, that kind of looks like... Huh? Why, Curly, it is. What? That's Ted Perkins' old wreck. No doubt about it. And it... All right, you better wave him out past. He probably thinks we need help. It's all right, Ted. It's Michael Dare. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't need anything. Yeah, we're well, all right. Thanks anyway. Well, there's one thing about people around here. They mind their own business and don't ask no questions. And they don't answer them often either. How's that Applejack holding out? Two long hours went past. Only three cars came out from the village. 
and each time a long moment of tension while we waited to identify the occupants. But all of them were townspeople. Benny didn't show. One truck came down the logging road from the back hills loaded with dwarf spruce and fir. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We were waiting for an assassin, but the truck only carried Christmas trees. The night was crystal clear with bright stars hanging low in the blackness, but it kept turning colder and colder. And to leave in the Applejack didn't help much. And the wind, too, changed gradually and blew fitful and gusty and strange. Yeah, it's going to storm. Come a blizzard, maybe. Not tonight. Tomorrow sometime or tomorrow night. I know this country. I know the signs. Uh, there's an odd feeling in the air, all right. There's an even odder one in my leg. Log rolled over on it pretty near six years ago. Bothers me some in the winter. It's a lot worse, though, right before a storm. Well, that's kind of a handy thing to have. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. Like one time when Kathy was little. When her ma was still alive. God rest her soul. We had a big measles epidemic here in Brambury, and every night Kathy used to add a line to her prayers. She'd say, And please let me catch the measles so I can stay out of school like the other kids. <laughs> now she's wanted as a witness in a murder case. And somebody's prowling out there in the dark trying to find her and kill her. Little Kathy. Who never harmed anybody in her whole life. Some things just don't make sense, Johnny. Some things never have. There was another time once when men like Benny were prowling in the dark, trying to find a little child and kill him. And he hadn't harmed anybody either. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so it was. I like you, Johnny. Kathy will like you, too, and little Jill. Oh, now there's a pair for you. That kid looks more like a mother did at her age. Another car coming, Mr. O'Dare. Yeah, so there is. And this just might be the one. Maybe. I sure wish that Applejack hadn't run out. But it was only a couple of men Deputy Martin had sent out from town to relieve us and take over. Big men, calm and quiet, wearing plaid mackinaws and heavy lace boots and carrying Winchester 94s over their arms. They told us Benny Stark had been seen. He'd come up from the west, driven onto one of the roadblocks unexpectedly. In a flurry of shots, he'd broken through. The men couldn't understand his persistence. They thought he'd run for it, get out of the area once his presence was known. I didn't bother to explain, to put him straight, but I knew Benny had never run, not now. He was a trigger man, a professional killer with a reputation at stake. And he had his orders to silence Kathy O'Dare. A half hour later, we'll be back in town, turning into the main street around the village square. Strings of colored lights on a tall pine in the center of the square blinked and sparkled as they swayed in the wind. Around a hundred cars and trucks were parked in the street and in the lot behind the town hall. And the sound of singing drifted out from inside. They're practicing carols and things for the big doings on Christmas Eve. Ain't it beautiful? The men at the roadblock had given a description of Benny's car and the license number. It was just barely possible. Got something in mind, Johnny? Yeah, let's take a look through those parked cars. I don't know. If it was me, I sure wouldn't be hanging around here. I'd stick to the tall timber. Yeah, but you're not a city boy, Mike. Tall timber is foreign soil to Benny. He's only comfortable when he's close to a crowd. He the fellow that's supposed to have done that murder? No, it was the man he works for, a cafe owner, ex-gangster, a man named Nick Shern. Let's check that lot around at the side. I don't think he'd show here in front. He'd be taking a big chance showing anywhere. In a town this size, people know each other. It's his job to take chances. And he probably doesn't realize... Wait a minute. That sedan against the building with the side window broken. Seven, eight, two, one. That's his car, Johnny. Yeah, wait here. I eased my gun out of the holster and started toward the car. There were no lights in the lot, only the soft glow reflected from the packed snow underfoot. And the car itself stood in the dark shadows next to the building... I couldn't see whether anyone was in it or not. The singing seemed to swell louder as I approached. I moved slowly, watching for any sudden movement. (sighs) The car was empty. It 
It was time, past time, to talk to Kathy O'Dare. And with the pressure tightening, the danger close to home now, her father was ready to take me to her. We drove over to Dan Martin's house, where it turned out Kathy and her daughter were staying. Dan's mother had been looking after her. Dan was there when we yeah. arrived, busy on the phone. Yeah, I know the car all right. The one Jed bought last spring down in Bay City. Seven, three, nine, two. Uh, where was it parked? All right, keep an eye out, Charlie. So long. Benny Stark has stole himself another car. Huh? Took Jed Wharton's station wagon. Well, what for? That was a better one he had. Charlie says the steering gear was sprung. I guess it happened when he crashed that roadblock. But how's Kathy and the young'un? Oh, fine. They're asleep upstairs. Uh, Mom's next door helping Mrs. Barton stuff a turkey. Johnny, you, uh, you figure it could wait till morning. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Dare. I've got to talk to her tonight. All right. I'll go wake her up. Mr. Dollar, no matter what she's done, don't hurt her any more than you have to. As far as I know at the moment, Dan, all she's guilty of is withholding information. And most people would have done the same thing. Nick Shearn's a rough boy to tangle with. She was scared, that's all. Lost her head. She never did belong in a city. She belongs right here in Brambury. This is her kind of life. Why did she leave? Well... Oh, we argued one day, and she said she'd show me. So she ran off and married that fellow. He treated her bad, finally left her. But she was too proud to come back. She wouldn't have come back now if she hadn't have been so scared. Well, maybe it'll work out now. She ought to stay. Her kid ought to grow up here, learn the outdoors and the woods like Kathy used to know it. Why, she roamed through those hills like a young Indian, knew every trail in that forest, every timber camp and trapper's cabin from here to the ridge. I remember one time the two of us were up toward... Dan! What's the matter? What is it, Mr. O'Dare? You said... You said Jill and Kathy were asleep upstairs. Ain't that what you said, Dan? Of course that's what I... Mike... What's happened? They're not up there. They're not up there anywhere else in the house. They're gone. <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little girl who believes in Santa Claus, a big girl who believes in very little, and both of them facing death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>